get started. We're about, about on time. So, uh, morning everyone. I'm, my name is Jim Steele. I'm a software engineer with an uh, organisation called CSIRO, which is the Australian National Research Agency. Uh, but I actually work as an engineer on our Onto server product, which is a fire technology server. Um, and a couple of our other tools, Shrimp and Snapper, which perhaps some of you have seen or heard of or heard mentioned in some of the other talks. Um, terminology browsers and uh, terminology resource editors. Um, so I'm going to give, uh, try and give a basic rundown of fire terminology. Um, and my hope is that this is a fairly practical talk. Um, the, the really important contribution, I think, of fire in the terminology space is that the API the APIs that FIRE supports the terminology are really useful for practical use of terminology. In the past there have been a lot of standards that have been very good at allowing people to author terminologies, but FIRE's real strength is allowing people to use them in uh, runtime systems. Um, so hopefully that's, if you, if you have a takeaway from this talk, it'll be how to use FIRE in um, active deployed systems, uh, FIRE terminology in active deployed systems. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a little bit of motivation of why uh, terminology is important. Hopefully the fact that you're here means that you recognise that it is pretty significant uh, in the fire sort of ecosystem. Uh, and why terminology service is a useful thing. Um, how familiar are people with fire, uh, the, the general sort of fire APIs, creating resources, changing resources, invoking operations? Are people familiar with that? Uh, anyone not familiar with that? Excellent. Okay, so I do have a slide on that, but I'll go through it very, very quickly. Uh, there's a very good cheat sheet outside the main room um, with fire basics of how you create resources and invoke operations. Um, I will have the reason I've got that stuff in there is that I do have examples of uh, resources and invoking operations as we go through. Um, so I'll, I'll try to skip over that fairly briefly since it's not people are basically familiar with that. Uh, once I've done that, I'll go through the fire resources. Uh, there are three that I'm particularly interested in today. The code system, uh, value set, and concept map. Um, and I'll go through, uh, I think, five of the important operations that are used in terminology. Um, look up and expand on code system. Uh, look, up and, uh, look up and subsume on code system. Expand and validate code on uh, value set. And translate on concept map. I won't go into uh, closure, which is the other terminology operation, or compose, which is another terminology operation. Uh, Michael will touch on closure in his talk later on today, so if you're interested in some of the more advanced fire stuff, um, please come to, to Michael's talk. I think that's at 11 o'clock, 10.45. Um, I'll also touch very briefly on some of the way that fire exposes standardised terminologies, like SNOMED and LOIC. Uh, but I won't go into that in much detail if you're interested in LOIC. Hopefully you were able to get to Daniel's talk yesterday where he covered that in a lot more detail. Um, if not, he's around, so go and ask him questions. I can, can answer some, but he can answer them much better regarding LOIC. Uh, and if you're interested in how SNOMED exposes itself, then again, please come along to Michael's talk later today. He'll go into a lot more detail about implicit value sets, uh, expression constraint language, and other parts of SNOMED. Um, I will, hopefully I'll have a little bit of time to go into a couple of tips and tricks that are useful across fire, but particularly important when you're using terminology services, or that we found very useful using terminology services. Uh, and I'll try to touch on um, the way terminology appears in searching other resources as well, um, particularly in code above and below style searches. Uh, and then I'll finish with some use cases. So that comes back to that practical aspect that um, hopefully that'll, that'll uh, give an indication if you're doing data input or you're doing data validation or analysis or analytics, then what are the parts of terminology, which operations and resources are you likely to be using in those certain use cases. Okay, so the motivation, um, terminology, um, the way we see it, uh, is the basis of shared meaning between different systems when you're using fire. So the fire spec and the, uh, to an extent the profiles that you use, they give you the structures that allow you to read resources that come from other systems, but it is the, the shared terminology um, amongst those systems that allows those systems to understand that information and use it meaningfully. Um, so it, it really is a very important part of making fire actually work 
as an interoperable standard. Um, particularly in a large system, having a single reference for terminology is really valuable uh, because it means you don't have uh, copies of terminology scattered across your system. Uh, and the via terminology service allows you to do that by having a common API at least to those things. Um, and having that externalized terminology also makes it much easier to keep up to date, if, particularly if you're using a standardized terminology like Loin Course Nomad. If you're moving to a, new ver a newer version, then having that in a single place makes it much easier to deal with uh, those updates and changes. Um, so just a very quick summary of some of the fire basics. Um, Fire's resources work on the scrub model, so search, create, read, update, and delete. And those are the HTTP methods you use to create, um, search, read, update, and delete those resources. Um, more importantly, I thought I'd recap the operations. So there are multiple ways to invoke operations in Fire. Uh, operations are used a lot more in terminology than in a lot of other parts of the Fire spec. Um, uh, depending on the operation, you can um, you can either get or post uh, to the operation endpoint to invoke it. Um, get only works for item potent operations. I think all the ones I talk about today will be item potent operations, so you can use all of them using get. The advantage of using get style invocation um, is that it's HTTP cacheable, uh, which can be very important for performance reasons. Um, and depending on the operation, you can either invoke it at the root level, uh, and the only one for of those in terminology is closure. Um, at the type level, um, so slash resource slash operation, um, or at the instance level, resource ID operation. Um, so when I go into the specific operations, I'll deal with which of those are supported. Um, if you invoke using a post, you can always put in a parameters resource in the body. Uh, in some circumstances where the operation will know what to do if there's only one resource that comes across, then you can just post that resource and I'll have an example of that uh, when I get into the specific operations. So that's a quick fire summary. Um, okay, so the first um, important uh, resource from a terminology point of view is the code system. Uh, a code system is, uh, at its simplest, just a collection of terms. Um, identified by a URI and usually a version as well. Um, typically, the code system exhibits some kind of hierarchy, and that hierarchy can have a different meaning depending on which code system we're looking at. Um, the code system, since STU3, allows you to define uh, properties and filters, which you can then use when you're constructing value sets over that code system. Um, code systems can be infinite, so there are important code systems like UCOM that are actually infinite, where you can't enumerate all of the concepts that are available. Um, the ones I deal with today uh, will be finite ones, so I'm trying to keep it fairly simple, um, but some of them can be infinite. And some of the code systems that we deal with are standardised ones, like LOINC, SNOMED, RxNorm, ICD, UCOM, uh, and so on. Um, and some of them are custom, and the ones I'm going to use as examples today will be custom, so I don't depend on any prior knowledge of any of these standardised code systems. Um, having said that, the use of standardised code systems is uh, hugely advantageous. So if, when you get choices in systems of whether you can use standardised code systems or roll your own, um, I would encourage you to, to use standardised ones, but in reality, there are always going to be de facto um, sort of custom code systems that you need to use in the system. Um, and uh, Fire is actually quite well set up for allowing you to do that and then to map those across um, to or from standardised code systems as you need them. Um, so the structure of code system in the Fire spec. Um, most of this stuff at the top is metadata. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. It's fairly similar to what you'll see in a lot of the resources. Um, things like the uh, identifier, um, title, status, date, publisher, and so on are fairly common across a lot of fire resources um, and don't have specific meaning for code system um, for the way that the operations work. Some of the exceptions to that are the URL and the version are important because uh, in a lot of the, op the terminology operations you can refer to a code system uh, by URL or, and often by version as well. Um, the uh, the um, case sensitive is obviously important because that uh, dictates how uh, lookup will work, for example, um, and how searching within the code system will work. 
Um, the value set property, um, the sort of sixth from the bottom there, that's important because if you set that, then you you are saying that there is an implicit value set for this code system, which is all of the codes that exist in this code system. Now, some servers might require you to then create that value set that has that URI. Um, other servers will make that value set available to you as an implicit value set. So you won't have to create it, it will just automatically be there if you set that property. Um, hierarchy meaning is important, so the, the code system can have a hierarchy which is um, grouped by, is a part of, or classified with, and this will change the way that um, some of the filters work uh, when you use them. Um, version needed can be important, although for most of the um, most of the use, it doesn't particularly matter, um, particularly when you're getting started. Um, uh, content, it similarly, can be important. It tells you whether all of the, the code system is present in the, the uh, resource definition or whether it's just a fragment or whether it's missing entirely. Uh, that can be used in some servers, but not an awful lot. Um, so once we get past the metadata, then we get down into the actual structure of the code system. So as I said, since STU3, code systems allow you to define uh, filters and properties. Um, properties are things that you can attach to a code that have extra information. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll have some examples of this in a moment. And then filters uh, are often closely tied to properties, but they need not be. Um, and these are things that allow you, when you're creating a value set, to filter on uh, uh, to filter out concepts or to, to find concepts according to some filter. So typically what you'll see is you'll define a property um, and then you'll define a filter to match that property with certain operators. So you might... Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate that with an example in a moment. Um, and the, the properties that we define um, can have different types, um, code, coding, string, integer, boolean, and date time. But they are simple valued things, so don't break down into more detailed structure. Um, the most important part of your code system, obviously, is going to be the actual concepts that are defined in the code system. Um, and these are actually defined in a hierarchy. So within the code system resource, there's a concept um, attribute, and that concept attribute can have other concepts nested within it. And uh, typically, that depending on what the hierarchy meaning um, attribute was set as back in the metadata section of the resource, then that will indicate um, uh, relationships between the concepts like subsumption. Um, uh, within a concept, you define you must define a code. You can display a dis you can define a display um, and a definition. You can also define designations. Um, by default, the different designations you can define are based on SNOMED designation types, which allow you to define synonyms or, um, I think, fully specified names and preferred terms. Um, I might have those three wrong, but there are certainly three that come from SNOMED um, that you can use. But that is extensible, so if you're profiling code system, you can allow for other kinds of designations. Um, and this is also where you can define the properties of the concepts that you're defining. Um, so those might be values, they might be codes, they might be strings, integers, booleans, um, date times, and that has to match the type of the property that was declared um, earlier on in the resource. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the theory of it. Um, what I've got here is an example that I'm going to use throughout the talk um, based on uh, Australian states. Now, I don't expect anyone to know Australian geography, but uh, in Australia we have two types of... Um, uh, geographical areas, we have territories and we have states and they have different jurisdictional consequences. So what I've got is a code system that starts with um, Australia as a top level thing and then breaks down into each of the different states. And I don't have the entire thing here but it is up on the server if you want to play with it later. Um, so what I've defined is a value set. I've, I've defined a bunch of those um, metadata things up here um, with a URI, AU jurisdictions here which we'll come back to later. Um, uh, and I've defined a couple of properties. So I've defined a, a capital property, which is just a string, which says what's the name of the capital of that, that area, uh, and a neighbor property, which is code typed, and that's which other geographical areas um, share a border with, with, um, with this other one. Um, so, uh, so that's the property, and then I've defined filters for those as well. So I'm saying for the capital, you're allowed to filter on uh, uh, the capital equals some string, 
and you're also allowed to say, does the capital exist? So is there a capital defined for concepts? So those are the two filters that are available for the capital um, uh, code. Uh, and then for the neighbor, I've defined equals exists, is a, is not a, and descendant of. Because this is a, a code typed property, I can start to use hierarchy in my filters. Um, so I can search for, uh, for example, any, any state that neighbors another state um, without having to name specifically which state. Uh, so there's a couple of filters. And here's a couple of concepts. So what I've got up here is I've got a concept for the top level jurisdiction, Australia. And then within that, I've got a, a state jurisdiction, and then I've got a specific state, which is Western Australia. And what I've put on this one is a designation to say that there's a synonym, and that SNOMED code, uh, 9013.09, is actually the SNOMED code for synonym. Um, and uh, what that means, I'll illustrate in a later example when we um, do validate code. And I've defined a couple of the, the properties, so I've said the capital is Perth, uh, and the neighbouring uh, regions are NT and SA. And those are other codes that are defined further down. I'm not going to show the whole thing here, um, but there are other, other concepts that are defined in this code system. If you want to uh, have properties that actually refer out to other code systems, then you can't do that using code. You need to do that using coding um, type properties. OK, so there are two important operations that are available on code system. Um, the first is lookup. Uh, so lookup is a type level um, operation, meaning you just invoke it on code system, the code system resource directly. Um, it's idempotent, so you can call it over and over, which means you can call it as a get request. Um, and it allows you to just retrieve the details about a given concept within a code system. Um, so you do that by providing, by specifying the concepts uh, using code and optionally the system, oh, not optionally, um, the system and optionally the version of the the code you're interested in, or as a coding um, resource if you're doing a post request. Um, and this, this can be really useful for just determining whether a code exists within the code system. So you, you call lookup, and if you get back a 404, you know the code doesn't exist. If it does come back, it'll have the actual details of it. Uh, you can also uh, retrieve specific properties and designations of the code. So there's a parameter to the lookup operation which allows you to specify which properties you're interested in seeing. Uh, if you don't specify which properties you're interested in seeing, it's up to the server to decide which properties it's going to return you. Uh, return you. So if you are interested in specific properties, then it's usually worthwhile to make sure you actually request those in your lookup, or you might not get them. Um, so for example, if I send a, a lookup uh, request here, um, this is just using our demo server. Um, you're welcome to play along if you want. Um, uh, I'm just doing a lookup on the WA code within the, and I've passed in the URI of the, the code system that we've defined um, as the system, and I've asked for the display property and I've asked for the capital property to come back, and so that's what I get when I, when I actually get the results. I see the display up there and I see the, the capital come back um, with its value as well, but I'm not getting the neighbours one because I didn't ask for that property. So you can use property to make sure you get the properties that you want to see, and you can also do it to optimise the, the payload, to say, don't send me all of this other stuff that I'm not interested in. So uh, we're not seeing the child and parent properties of this as well, which we get from the hierarchy. We're not seeing the neighbouring uh, geographical regions. We're just seeing the properties we asked for. So the other operation on code system um, that's useful is subsumes. Uh, and this is something we can use to explore the hierarchy of the code system. Um, so uh, this one we can call it either type or instance level. So if we've created our code system and we know it's ID, we can include that ID uh, in the call. Um, or we can do it at the type level and just pass in the URI of the code system that we're interested in. Um, and it just allows us to see what subsumption relationships exist between two codes, if there are any. Um, so we pass that in as code A and code B. Again, either as code system inversion or as codings. Um, and the result will come back and tell us the subsumption relationship. So it'll be equivalent if they're the same code, um, or equivalent codes. Subsumes if one subsumes the other. Um, subsumed by if it's in the, the other direction. Or not subsumed if there's no subsumption relation between them. Um, now this is very dependent on the code system's hierarchy meaning. So if the code system doesn't have a, a hierarchical meaning, if there's no hierarchy in the code system, then your subsumed requests will always say not subsumed. Um, if they're real codes. Um, the other thing, the other method uh, operation that you can use for exploring the hierarchy of a code system is um, closure. 
Um, Clojure is a lot more complicated. It's a lot more powerful um, in terms of what you can do. Um, it's not an idempotent, um, which makes it a little bit more complicated. If you're interested in how closure works, then please come along to Michael's talk. Um, I think he'll cover that. Um, so just as an example of subsume, so I'm sending a request here. It's another get request. Um, so I'm just, and I'm doing this at the type level, so I pass in the system as a URI, and I'm just saying, is uh, there a subsumption relationship between AU, the Australian code, and Queensland, which is one of the states? Um, and it says, yes, um, it's a subsumes relationship between those two. So Australia subsumes um, Queensland in this case. Okay, so the, the second resource um, that is interesting from a terminology point of view, and probably the most interesting resource, is um, value set. And value set is how we uh, take sets of codes that are defined in one or more code systems, and we create a list um, of those codes. Um, the way we do that is we use a compose um, a property of the, code of the value set resource to include codes from other systems, whether by filter or by explicitly listing them or including them all uh, without any conditions at all, or we can include other value sets, so setting up a chain, and we can also exclude things as well. Um, the other purpose of value set is that when you expand, if, if you've defined a value set using compose, uh, perhaps using some filters, then um, if you call the expand operation, which I'll get to in a moment, then the result of that also comes back as a value set with an explicit list of codes um, uh, which are included in the expansion property. So you kind of see these two kinds of value sets. Value set definitions, which are defined using compose, and then the result of expansions, which come back with a populated expansion thing. There's nothing to stop you using both, but uh, really, if you're defining a value set, you really should be doing it using compose, not using the explicit expansion. Okay, so the structure, the, a lot of the metadata is the same as what we saw in code system. Um, so there's a URL and a version, um, which are important for identifying the value set in uh, operations or when we're importing it from another value set, perhaps. Um, a lot of the other metadata is not particularly significant to the, uh, the way the operations work. Um, in fact, uh, none of those have, have any particular um, influence on how the, how the operations work. Um, but a, a lot of profiles uh, will insist that those be there, and they do make sense um, to be there, uh, to fill out all the details. Um, but I won't cover them here, they're just metadata. So, the, as I said, when you're defining a value set, um, the, the property you use is the composed property. Um, essentially what you're interested in the composed property is um, include clauses and exclude clauses. And the way it will work is that all includes are processed first, and then after all the includes have been applied, then the excludes will be applied. Um, and what you can include, and, and they, they work the same way, so what you can, what you can define in an include is you, you define a system and a version, typically, unless you're just bringing in another value set. And then you can either include a list of concepts um, explicitly, or you can include a filter. Um, so you, you can either have a list of concepts or one or more filters. You can't have both a list of concepts and filters. Um, you can either have one or the other. Um, if you define multiple filters within a single include, then they get added together. So you'll get the intersection of those filters. If you want to um, bring in things from two different filters, then you need to use two includes. So if you want to union your filters, then you need to have two separate includes. Um, the other thing that you can put, if, if you have neither concepts or filters, then what that means is you're bringing in the entire code system. So if you've just got the system set, um, and perhaps a version, and you don't have any concepts <laughs> listed, and you don't have any filters, then you're bringing in the entire code system. Um, you can also import value sets in an include. So if you've defined a value set somewhere else and you want to include it or exclude it in the new value set that you're defining, you can include that in there. And that will be, uh, that will be um, anded with the filters as well. So if you import a value set and you define some filters, then what actually comes in will be the intersection of all of those. Uh, and excludes work exactly the same way. So you can exclude an entire code system, you can exclude uh, a specific list of codes, uh, you can exclude filters, they'll be anded together. If you want them to be um, ORed instead, you can just define multiple excludes. 
And what comes back um, when you expand is, is fairly similar. Um, you get an expansion which will have, um, it'll define the parameters that we used in the expansion request. And this is really why you shouldn't use expansion to actually enumerate the codes you want to be in a value set, um, because the expansion is contextual. Um, so it will define the parameters that we used in the expansion. It'll tell you when the expansion was performed. Um, it'll have an identifier for the expansion. And then it'll list all of the codes. Now, some servers, when you get the expansion of a value set, will show you hierarchy in the expansion. Um, others won't. So it'll depend. You can ask it to not give you hierarchy or to give you hierarchy, but depending on the ser how the server does expansion, it may refuse to give you hierarchy. Particularly if, for example, the server's uh, careful about the way it orders results, then the combination of ordering results in an expansion um, and showing hierarchy is very, very difficult. So well, certainly our server won't show you hierarchy in expansion for that reason, because we care about the order of the results that come back. So I've got a little example here. Um, what I've said is I've defined a value set here, which is just the mainland Australian states. So what I'm saying is, I've got an include that says um, I want uh, all of the concepts from the AU jurisdictions where the concept is a descendant of AU state. Now, descendant of is one of the is not the most common filter. Usually, you would use isa, um, but isa would actually include AU state as well, um, as well as all the states. Um, so I'm just asking for the descendants of that, so I won't get AU state itself as a concept. Uh, and then I'm going to exclude Tasmania because that's what we do in Australia. <laughs> and I'm only interested in mainland states, so I'm going to cut it out. Uh, and that gets processed afterwards. So all of the, all of the, if I had other includes, they would get processed first, and then the excludes get processed last. Um, so that's a very simple little value set. Um, the main thing that we want to do with a value set when we're using it is expand it. So uh, expand is can be run at type or instance level. It's item potent, so you can use get requests. Um, and it allows you to retrieve the value, the expansion of the value set subject to a number of parameters. Um, the results will come back as an expansion and the really important parameters are these first three. So uh, you can specify a filter, which is a string, which is basically a search term. This is one of the main uses of the expand operation, is to search for terms based on some string. Um, and count and offset are important parameters because they allow you to do paging. So if your expansion is going to return an awful lot of concepts and perhaps you're doing a data entry widget where you only want to show the first 10, then you can specify counts equals 10 to make sure that only 10 come back. And then if you want to page through subsequent ones, you can say, give me the next 10 would be count equals 10, offset equals 10. Um, so you, you can page through um, with expand. Um, the other parameters are less common. You can use them to tweak the structures that come back in the expansion to include designations, to include or not include the definition of the value set, um, <coughs> to only include active codes. Um, they're less common, and I won't go into them in a lot of detail. Um, the last one is interesting, um, the profile, because it allows you to define a structure in uh, once and reuse it, which kind of summarizes all of those other properties and some other things that you can tweak about what comes back in the expansion. So, yeah, so the, the quick summary is expand is the best way to search for a code within a value set, um, use, particularly using that filter parameter. So what I've got here is, this is an expand request without a filter. And now what I've done here is, rather than pass in parameters, either as URL parameters or in a parameters object, I'm just sending a resource across. And the reason this will work is that Expand must have a value. Expand at the type level must have a value set, so we can assume that if a resource comes across which is a value set, it knows what to do with it. Um, so we, I just send the value set on its own across as the body of the post, and it knows how to expand that. Um, that's not specific to terminology. That's true in full fire operations. If there's one like compulsory resource type parameter which is expected, then you can just post that as a single resource in the body um, to the operation. Uh, and what I'm getting back here is I'm getting back the expansion. So I, I don't have the definition anymore because the default behavior of this server is it doesn't return the definition for an expand request. You can change that if you want. But it'll come back with just these five states, um, which are the mainland states. Um, the other operation which is useful for value set is validate code. And validate code uh, allows you to check whether a code exists within that value set. 
So it's a little bit analogous to look up um, on a code system, is it? In that it allows you to check whether the code is valid. Uh, but in this case, it's relative to those includes to the definition of the value set. The other thing it allows you to do is to check the display text of the code. So you can pass in a display text perhaps that a user has entered as a parameter, and the um, the operation will check whether that's an acceptable um, display text for that for that um, for that concept. Um, so it's a it can work at type or instance level. It's item potent, so you can use get requests. Um, uh, you can pass in the code as code system version or coding or as a codable concept. Um, and this is the main method that you use if you're validating um, user supplied data, whether that's as, it, as they're typing it or selecting it, or perhaps you've been given a dump of data and you want to check whether all the values of the fields are acceptable. And this is the operation that you use. So here's a, oh, that's a, that's a typo. Um, that should say validate code at the top. But what I'm passing in, in this case, I'm going to do a post style operation invocation. I'm going to pass in a parameters object. So the code value is going to be Queensland. The system is going to be our, um, and that's incorrect as well. That should be the, oh no, sorry. So that's the system of the code. That's not the URI of the value set. Um, so the, the code comes in as code and system. And then I have, I'm actually going to post the value set in the parameters object explicitly. So I'm not, in this case, creating a resource and then uh, using it on the server, I'm just sending the resource across with the operation request. Um, this is very useful if you're doing something contextual where you don't have to, you don't want to have to create the thing on the server because it's a transient resource that you just care about for a little while. So you can just post it in the operation body and the server will evaluate it and then drop it on the floor and you can move on. And the result comes back in this case, um, I didn't supply a display parameter so it hasn't checked the display text and it's telling you that. Um, and it's, it's told you what the actual display is and it's come back with a result saying yes, this code is in this value set. Okay, so I'm just going to take a brief diversion to talk about well-known terminology. So there are a bunch of terminologies such as SNOMED, LOINC, RxNorm, um, ICD and so on uh, that have specific mappings into five terminology resources with standardized code systems. And when I talk about standardized code systems, what that means is it's got a specific URI that you can expect for that code system. Um, it's got standard filters and properties that you can expect to be available regardless of which terminology server you're using. Um, there are often implicit value sets, um, particularly in the case of SNOMED and Wood. Um, and in the case of SNOMED, there are currently implicit concept maps as well. So I'll just br very briefly summarize what those are for these well-known terminologies. So for SNOMED CT, uh, it's actually a little bit complicated, the URI, you can have multiple, U uh, no, I'm wrong, that's for the version. Um, the, the standard URI is HTTP SNOMED info slash CT. When you're d talking about versions of that, you can expect optionally the addition and the version and the date as well. Um, it offers filters of concepts uh, by subsumption, by ref set, and by ECL expression. And if you're interested in those, please come to Michael's talk. He'll cover them in much more detail. It offers a range of implicit value sets for all codes by subsumption, by ref sets, uh, the list of all ref sets and codes within a ref set. Um, and recently, they have implicit concept maps for historical association. So if a code has been made inactive in a recent release, what they'll typically do is that they'll say, there's a replacement code for that. And you can uh, invoke these concept maps and using the translate operation to find out what that replacement code is. Um, if you're interested in more detail about SNOMED, please come to Michael's talk. Uh, LOINC is one of the other well-known terminologies. Um, the URI is http loink.org. Uh, it has filters for LOINC parts, for copyright status, and for the multi-actual hierarchy. Um, and there are implicit value sets for all LOINC codes, for answer lists, and for the multi-actual hierarchy as well. Um, again, if you're interested in a lot more detail about LOINC, please talk to Daniel or me afterwards. So the third resource that I'm going to cover fairly quickly is Concept Map. Um, so Concept Map is the way that we um, define mappings between codes uh, across different value sets. Um, the structure, again, there's a lot of metadata up the top. The most interesting stuff here, again, there's a URL and a version. Um, and there are source and target value sets defined, which are the context of the map. Um, and you typically need to use those when you're invoking the translation method. Uh, then within the concept map, the, the actual tuples of the mappings are broken up into groups. And this is new in STU3. 
Um, this allows you to, rather than every time you define a code to code mapping, having to repeat the, the code system URI of the source and the target elements, you can group those together. So what you could say is, if I've got a map from my jurisdictions to SNOMED, which is the example I'll show in a moment, I don't have to repeat the, the jurisdictions and SNOMED URIs every time. I can just say that this group is for mappings from these jurisdiction codes to these SNOMED codes. Uh, and then once I get down into the actual elements, which are the actual tuples of the mapping themselves, I just put code to code and the equivalence relationship that holds between them. That's the other important part of the, the mappings is that um, it's not as simple as a code maps to another code. You can say that a code is equal to another code, equivalent to another code, is wider than another code. So there are a, a set of about 10 um, different uh, mapping, concept map equivalence um, relationships that can hold, and you can define those individually for each um, code to code um, mapping in your concept map. There is a new unmapped section down the bottom, which says if there are no other mappings for this code, um, from this value set, then use this rule instead, which might either be a constant code or defer to another um, concept map. It's quite complicated. Um, I'm not sure whether Michael's going to talk about that, but I won't cover that in detail in my example here. Um, so this, here's a simple example. I've defined a, a, co a concept map, that should say. Type those all through this. Um, I've got a little bit of view, uh, metadata up the top. I've got a group um, saying that this is for jurisdiction to SNOMED mappings. Then I've mapped the, the Queensland code across, across to this SNOMED code, which is actually the Queensland geographical region, um, which is, I've said is equivalent, perhaps related to, would have been a better um, uh, uh, equivalence relationship. But, yeah. And then I've got um, the meaning for the other states as well. Um, the main thing that you want to do with a concept map is you want to actually translate. Um, so this allows you to translate from one value set to another. Um, either according to the concept map resources that you've defined or um, based on other knowledge that is available to the server. So some servers will allow you just to translate according to a concept map and some will have heuristics, um, possibly even machine learning type heuristics on the server that, that try and guess what you're mapping to. Um, and so there are, there are servers that are able to do that as well where you don't have to define a concept map, you can just try and translate and the, the server will make its best effort to find a, an equivalent concept. Um, so, but typically, Translate, um, when people use it, is about looking up a concept map resource. Um, you pass in a code as, again, either a code system version or a coding or a codable concept. You specify, um, optionally, the source value set and usually the target value set that you're interested in the mapping um, going to. You can run um, the concept map in reverse, so you can pass in the code, which is the target code, and then say, find the source codes for that as well. Um, and the results come back as parameter with match elements, and that can be multiple match elements, because there's no requirement that there's only one tuple per source code or target code. Uh, so here's a very simple example. I've used a get request, so it's cacheable again, and I've asked for the, the translation of Queensland um, across to um, the SNOMED value set. Um, and it's come back and told me there's an equivalence match to this 22377, etc. code and so on. Uh, and the results um, parameter tells me that there is actually a result, otherwise it would have been false. Okay, so the bundling of all of these things that I've covered, so code system, value set, concept map, um, and most of the operations I've talked about, um, allow a server to declare that it is a terminology service as well, and it can do that by including this URI um, in its uh, capability statement. So um, if you're hitting a server and you want to know whether it does terminology things, you can look for that, or you can look for the individual capabilities. Um, I might, uh, in the interest of time, I might leave the other stuff to Michael's talk. Um, so if you're interested in how terminology is used in search or some of the tips and tricks, um, I'll just skip ahead very quickly to cover some of the use cases. So. Um, if you're interested in designing interfaces for data entry, what you really want to be concentrating on is choosing your code systems. Again, if you can choose standardized code systems, that's great. If not, define your own. Um, define your value sets, the values that you're actually interested in. And then typically you're going to use expand. Um, if you've got a small value set, maybe you're using a drop down. Um, if you've got a large value set, probably you're using type ahead selection. Um, and in that case, you'll be using expand with a filter to bring back the, the matching concepts. Um, if you're, doing oh, if you're creating a profile, you're really interested in defining value sets, 
You're probably working with code systems that have been defined, but maybe you're defining some code system resources. Um, you're making value sets with the codes that you want to allow, making sure you respect binding strengths, um, which often means you need, there are other codes that need to be in your value set for that property. Um, and then you really need to set up some processes for maintaining those, particularly if you're using standardized code systems. What happens if that um, code system changes version? There are new codes or old ones. Um, so making sure you've got some processes in place for maintenance. Uh, if you're doing analytics, you're probably mostly interested in uh, validate code. You might be interested in translate to map between different code systems. Um, and perhaps you're using subsumes or closure or validate code to try and categorize your data as well. Um, if you're exploring concepts, then lookup is the operation that will give you detail about the, the codes that you're looking for. Um, and, look, and you can explore um, hierarchy using subsumes, closure, or child count relationships. Uh, just an obligatory plug, um, we have a terminology server that is um, available and used in Australia as a national server. And we have free um, browsers for terminology in the form of shrimp and a resource editor for the terminology resources uh, called Snapper, which uh, you're welcome to, to use if you're creating terminology resources. Okay, thank you. So we might have just a minute for questions. Yeah. Could you just say what the purpose and use of the naming system resources? Uh, I might defer that one to Michael. I'd, we don't use it, in short. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, pretty much. If we we don't use it, we haven't had anyone calling for it. But it's simply a coding system that we do not own, or what is the? I don't get the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah ask around. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen it used, to be honest. Um, certainly in the terminology thing. So, I mean, in the value sets and also in the code system, you were, the sh examples you showed, you basically said what kind of operations that you were supposed to be able to, or that you can do. Yep. Um, but I guess that those operations that would need to be enforced by the terminology server, because, I mean, the value set definition is just a description, or yes. is it a blueprint? Because what I'm wondering is if we, if we decide for instance, you have a, a national situation where you want to distribute these to various systems that are going to use the value sets and the code system resources. If you then sort of require them to be able to do certain operations on those systems as well, yeah. uh, it might prove difficult to achieve sort of a, a good way of uh, distributing them because you won't necessarily be able to do everything that the value set says that you as a fire service should be able to do. Yeah, I mean, your, your server needs to support those operations and support the semantics as they're defined by the spec. Um, so if, if the server supports expand, then it should be able to read the definition of that value set and retain the expansion according to those filters and inclusions. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm not sure it does. Maybe we can talk later. Yeah, sure. But yes, like in some cases you're just going to be interested in exchanging the definitions, but if you need to actually use them to validate codes or expand, then your server needs to support those operations. Okay, thank you very much.